so thank you for the invitation to come speak. Um, as Peter said, I'm going to be talking about the statistics of the zeta zeros, uh, especially macroscopic, mesoscopic and macroscopic phenomena. These are technical terms that come from random matrix theory, or maybe more properly physics. Um, but I'll, I'll say more precisely what I mean uh, later on. Um, the first half of this talk especially is meant to be introductory, so please do ask questions. Um, just to give you a rough idea of what I'm going to be talking about, usually when we talk about the statistics of the uh, zeros of the zeta function, the Riemann zeta function, we are talking about a random collection of consecutive zeros high up on the imaginary axis that are bounded in numbers. So we're looking at, say, 10 uh, consecutive zeros or 20 consecutive zeros. Uh, and that's what I'm going to call microscopic phenomena. Um, the terms mesoscopic and macroscopic phenomena refer to slightly larger collections of zeros which grow in number as you increase up the axis. So uh, just to review some things, uh, we're going to be concerned with the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. Those, are real part, those have real part in between 0 and 1. And I've marked the first few of them here in dark hue. And, um, and you can find these with the argument principle. The first one's at 1 half plus i 14.13. The next one's at 1 half plus i 21.02. And the next one's at 1 half plus i 25.01. Right? Um, and these do, usually these don't play that much of a role, what the numerical values of the imaginary parts are, but that will actually come in later. So you should remember these numbers. Um, and in particular, it, um, in particular, let me cross this out. Uh, they all have real part equal to one half. That shouldn't be very surprising. So we assume the Riemann hypothesis is what follows, and we use this notation one half plus i gamma, so that a sum over gamma is just a sum over all the imaginary ordinates of the zeros. And the first fact about the statistics of the zeros uh, was known at least heuristically to Riemann, although a rigorous proof didn't come about until von Mangold, and that's that around height t these zeros have density roughly log t over 2 pi. So on a unit interval, there's log t over 2 pi of them. And uh, more precisely, we can state this just by counting the, uh, uh, it's not, <laughs> let me, OK. More precisely, we can state this just by counting the number of zeros that lie in between height 0 and t. And uh, a very precise formula for this is given by t over 2 pi times log t over 2 pi minus t over 2 pi plus a small error term. And on the Riemann hypothesis can be improved. Uh, so this is sort of the most basic fact about the zeros of the zeta function. And for the purposes that follow, I want to restate this in sort of probabilistic language. So we let s be um, some random variable uniformly distributed in between t and 2t. And we let dx be a small infinitesimal number. And we look at the probability that one of these gammas lies around the random variable s inside of an interval of size 2 pi over log t times dx. The zeros have density log t over 2 pi, right? So this thing should be asymptotic as t grows to dx, as long as dx is small. And um, just for the purposes that follow, let me restate this one more time. Um, we can just translate by 2 pi x over log t since we're, we're already randomizing. And um, this statement is exactly equivalent to the statement that the probability that one of these gammas lies at s plus 2 pi over log t times the interval x to x plus dx is asymptotic to dx. So this, this statement we can prove is just a restatement of the um, Riemann von Mangold formula. The next question one can ask about uh, the distribution of zeros was first um, asked, or at least a con convincing answer was given by Montgomery in the, um, in the early 70s. And that's the question whether one zero in a certain location affects the likelihood that some other zero is nearby. And the conjectured answer is uh, just given by this formula. So the probability that one of these gamma lies at s plus 2 pi over log t times the interval x to x plus dx. And then another one lies nearby at an interval, well, at s plus 2 pi over log t times the interval y to d dy. Um, where x and y are different. This is just asymptotic to 1 minus sine of pi of x minus y over pi of x minus y squared dx dy. And um, one interesting consequence of this conjecture, because uh, when x is very close to y, the sine function is very close to 1. And so in particular, this density is very close to 0. So there's very little likelihood that two zeros are um, much closer to each other than average. They sort of repel 
uh, quadratically, right? And so you should compare this to the probability for if they're modeled by a Poisson process, so the zeros didn't see one another at all, then we wouldn't see this repulsion effect here. This probability would just be given by dx dy. <laughs> so, th so there's something interesting going on about the, the likelihood that some zero is left next to another zero. Um, you can see this a bit more uh, viscerally just by making a histogram of gamma minus gamma prime for the first 10,000 zeros, say, and then stretching it out by the mean density. So here, uh, t is equal to 10,000, or rather, t over 2 pi times log t is equal to 10,000. Um, and we've stretched out by a factor of log t over 2 pi. Um, and here's the histogram we get, and you can see that it's a fairly accurate, uh, th this prediction of Montgomery, the sine kernel, is a fairly accurate prediction for it. I mean, 10,000 is not, I mean, this looks a bit sloppy out here, but 10,000 is, in the scheme of things, a fairly low number. So, um, you know, if we added more zeros in, this would be a much closer fit. Uh, but anyways, that's the, the pair correlation conjecture. The next question one can ask is, um, well, what effect does the placement of k minus 1 zeros have on a kth zero? And that's given by the k-level density conjecture. So we ask, what's the probability that some zero lies at a random s plus 2 pi over log t times the interval x1 to x1 plus dx1? Another one lies at s plus 2 pi over log t times x2 to x2 plus dx2 and so on. And the prediction is given by this, uh, this determinant formula. So it's, in the first place, surprising that you even get this, this nice formula. In fact, we'll see this, this formula has a lot more meaning than um, just that it's a nice formula. But um, so far, I've been working with this heuristically. So let me, I mean, we're working with infinitesimals here. So let me restate this rigorously. We can subtract s from each side of this, right? And then multiply by log 2 over 2 pi. And that gives us these quantities of gamma minus s stretched out by a factor of log t over 2 pi. So these are randomly translated and stretched out zeros. And we're asking the probability that um, one of them lies in some interval, another one lies in another interval, and so on. If we integrate this probability measure against a test function, uh, we get a more rigorous statement of this conjecture. It's called the GUE conjecture, or alternatively, the montgomery elishko law. And so it says that for fixed k, that's the k-level density, and some fixed test function with nice continuity and decay properties, like it's Schwartz, um, that this count against the function eta of these uh, stretched out, or these translated and stretched out zeros tends to uh, just this determinantal measure that we have on the right. And the reason this is especially interesting is that this, at least in random matrix theory, this probability distribution pops up all the time. Um, there's some debate about whether it pops up outside of random matrix theory. Like there seems to be um, a city in Mexico where if you time the arrival of buses, uh, it, uh, so, so some people are kind of skeptical of this um, in, in the back. But uh, if you time the arrival of buses, it seems to follow the same determinant pattern, whether there's just some other phenomenon that looks like this or not, I, I can't say. But it certainly appears quite a bit in random matrix theory. Um, so to see that, the easiest uh, ensemble to work with is a group of unitary matrices. So uh, we let u in be the uh, space of n by n random unitary matrices endowed with our measure. And we label the eigenvalues by e to the i 2 pi theta, and we fix theta to be in between uh, negative 1 half and 1 half. So we've taken the unit circle and split it open. There's going to be n eigenvalues inside this unit interval. And if we stretch this thing out so that it has mean unit spacing, like we've done for the zeta zeros, right? We're looking at the quantities n times theta. And if we compute the k-level density functions here and the limit as n goes large, it follows exactly the same probability distribution that we get for these zeta zeros. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, I mean, of course, uh, Vial and Dyson didn't really collaborate on this also, Vial and Bourdon. Um, Vial had a, a formula for, for this. Um, and then, yeah, it was, it was Dyson or Bourdon who, who rewrote it in this, this manner. Right. All right. Um, so there's another way to think about this, which may be more intuitive. It'll sort of motivate what com comes later anyways. So we take any fixed interval j 
and we count the number of these randomly translated and stretched out zeta zeros that happen to lie inside of J. Uh, this is a random variable, right? And we do the same thing uh, for the stretched out eigenvalues that lie in the same interval J. Um, and the consequence of the GUE conjecture, a fairly elementary consequence, is just that as T and N go to infinity, these tend in distribution to the same random variable. This isn't quite equivalent to the GUE conjecture, but it's very close. Um, if you allow yourself to count, not with just uh, characteristic functions of intervals, but more general test functions, it does give you uh, a statement which is equivalent to the GUE conjecture. So um, maybe I, I should say a few words about this. I don't have the blackboard, but imagine here uh, that instead of eta, I've just written the characteristic function of this interval j. Then um, this is just another way, this, this sum here, right, is just another way of counting the number of these stretched out and translated zeta zeros that happen to lie inside of j. And if we don't restrict ourselves to working with characteristic functions, but instead allow ourselves to work with arbitrary test functions, say they're piecewise continuous and have compact support, um, then the statement that this random variable and this random variable for uh, random matrix statistics tend in the same, tend in distribution to the same random variable and the limit is exactly equivalent to the GUE conjecture. Um, one way to see why this, why this establishes a GUE conjecture is just that we can have linear combinations of two different intervals, J1 and J2 here, and so we can see their covariance and their joint distribution and all that. And we can recover that same sort of statement we had about correlation functions of seeing the likelihood that one of them lies in uh, an interval x to x plus dx, and another one lies in an interval y to y plus dy, and, and so on, right? So this, this ends up being equivalent to the GUE conjecture. And this will be important later because, uh, well, counting with more general test functions ends up being the only thing we can really do at, at this scale for the zeta function. All right, uh, so there's lots of numerical evidence for this, uh, for the GUE conjecture. There's also uh, some theoretical uh, confirmation of it, and that is for test functions whose Fourier transforms have sufficiently compact support that is, the, the functions don't bunch up too much, uh, we can actually verify that the conjecture is true. So um, for k equals 2, that is, pair correlation is just due to Montgomery. For k equals 3, it's due to Heyshaw. And for all k greater than 3, it's due to Rudnick and Sarnak. Um, if we fix the Fourier transform of this thing to lie in this certain compact region, then these correlation functions tend to exactly what we expect for them to tend to. All right. Um, as I said earlier, well, maybe I forgot to remark about this. Um, one thing that this slide really brings out very clearly is that uh, we're only really seeing the effect of some gamma on other gammas, uh, which are a distance of 1 over log t away from, from each other, right? We don't see the effect that they have uh, farther apart just because these test functions eta uh, have compact support. That's more clearly here, right? So if the, I mean, you just don't see the effect that some gamma has on another gamma a further distance away. So um, these statistics at this scale, uh, where the zeros are separated, the zeros at a height t are separated by a scale of 1 over log t. We call those statistics microscopic because they're really the smallest scale where we can get meaningful information about the zeros. Um, if you limit yourself to what I've talked about so far, even if you know something else about the zeta zeros, if you just forget about it, there's two restrictions that you suffer from. Um, the first is that we can't say anything rigorous about the distribution of zeros when you count with test functions that are too oscillatory, that is, too bunched up at the microscopic level. So you can't get too fine of a count of the number of these randomly translated and stretched out zeros that lie in a given interval. Um, although if you make the interval long enough, you can get a better count. Uh, and the other, the other restriction that we suffer from is that you can't say anything about the distribution of zeros when you uh, count by test functions that aren't essentially supported at the microscopic level. So we can't say anything about the effect that some zero has on another zero that's a distance of one away when they're at a large height. We just haven't said anything about that yet. Um, so there's a philosophy that I want to promote. Um, today, at lunch, in an unrelated discussion, Peter was telling us that um, young mathematicians shouldn't be developing philosophies, but should be working in the trenches. And uh, so I, I prepared this talk before, before lunch, so I have a, a philosophy here. But we'll, we'll go into the trenches in a moment. Um, but at any rate, the, the philosophy that I want to promote, um, 
as philosophies go, it's somewhat vague, right? But it'll be elucidated by the examples. Um, is that uh, this first restriction here of not being able to count at a microscopic level by bunched up functions is, is a very serious obstruction. Like if we could, um, well, if we could resolve the pair correlation conjecture for more oscillatory functions than Montgomery considers, we could uh, prove, for instance, the twin prime conjecture. So any, any getting around this, this restriction is bound to involve a lot of uh, new ideas. Um, but the second restriction, even though I haven't said anything about uh, the location of zeros farther away yet, is really not that serious of a restriction. So any question that you can ask about the zeta zeros, provided answering it doesn't require counting with functions that are too oscillatory, uh, can be rigorously answered, at least as long as you assume that they're an hypothesis. So I'll try to elucidate this with a few examples. Uh, the first example is a theorem due to Fuji that actually came about um, almost concurrently with Montgomery's theorem. I think Selberg maybe had even, um, in an unpublished work, proven this even earlier. But at any rate, um, you let n of t be some function which grows as t goes to infinity, but it doesn't grow more quickly than, than log t. It, it grows at a rate of little o of log t. And you let s be, again, a random and uniformly distributed random variable on the interval t to 2t. And then you look at an interval j sub t, which grows with t, and its, its size is uh, n of t. And then you count, just like we were doing before, you count these uh, randomly translated and stretched out zeta zeros that happen to lie in this interval j of t. But now you're not looking at a fixed interval j of t. You're looking at one that grows with t, right? So a more traditional way of writing this is just in terms of these count functions. N. And um, the theorem of Fuji says that, well, as you would guess, the expected value of, of these counts is just n of t, right? It's, uh, we space them out to have mean unit density. Um, the variance is maybe more surprising, though. This is 1 over pi squared times log n of t. The reason this is surprising is that it's so small of a quantity. Uh, if, if the zeros didn't see each other at all, or they didn't see each other outside of a microscopic regime, we would expect this thing to sort of be uh, like the, the sum of Bernoulli variables. We would expect the variance of it to be of the same order as the expected value of it. And the, the logarithm is a much smaller number right, than, than n of t. So it means that uh, even, even at a uh, larger scale than microscopic, the distribution of zeros is somehow very, very rigid. And then, of course, uh, well, not of course, it's a complicated computation to show this, but um, these, these things end up tending to Gaussian variables with this expectation and this variance. All right. So this is where the word mesoscopic comes in. I, I was very careful to restrict n of t to be slowly growing here. Um, if you don't do that, this, this theorem ends up, uh, well, there's a phase change that happens. And so collections of zeros in this range I call mesoscopic, right? And these intervals, if you don't look at the stretched out zeros, but, um, but uh, just the unscaled zeros, right, these intervals we're looking at uh, have size which grows faster than 1 over log t, but they don't grow so quickly as, as the function 1, right? So they're shrinking. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. So Fuji even states his result in terms of s of t. But s of t, I'll, I'll talk about this later. Um, s of t is sort of the air term for the, the counting function. Right. So when you have control of the air term, that's, that's like knowing this quantity here. So Selberg. Yeah, yeah. So the, the theorem which people. Yeah, so Selberg's theorem is about um, the air term n of t minus its expected value on a, a very long scale, right? And this is just a, a short interval, yeah. Um, so that's why I say unpublished. I think after he did that computation, he did, he did this, which is just a matter of algebraically refining it. But, um, you know, it's, Fuji did it independently. Uh, okay, so in particular, this means there's some sort of the message to take from this is that there's some sort of uh, pattern among the zeros, uh, even at a mesoscopic scale. Right. All right. Um, and it, you don't have to look that far to figure out what the pattern is. There's a theorem of Kostin and Leibowitz uh, that has a very similar form. So we let n of m be some function which grows, but it doesn't grow quite as quickly as m. And then you look at some interval of size n of m, and you consider the counting function of the stretched out uh, eigenvalues that lie inside this interval i sub m. Uh, and the, the only point of this 
little o of m restriction is that you don't want to count all of the eigendyes in the unit circle. You just want to count some of them. Uh, then in this case, the expected value of this random variable, uh, as before, is n of m. The variance of it is 1 over pi squared times log n of m. And in distribution, we, you get a Gaussian distribution again, right? So here, um, this is, you, to have an interesting random variable, you just don't want to count all of the eigenvalues. So this is a natural boundary for the zeta function. It's a bit more mysterious why, why I had to restrict a little o of log t. We'll talk about why later. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this, this is pretty suggestive of the fact that these two theorems are so similar. And on the basis of this, well, really just on the basis of the variance computation, uh, Barry made, uh, made the conjecture that the zeros look like eigenvalues not only microscopically, not only at the microscopic scale, but also mesoscopically. I, I call this a heuristic conjecture of Barry because I, um, well, in the first place, Barry was a physicist, so it is a heuristic conjecture. But I, I don't know, um, <laughs> I don't, on top of that, e even nowadays, I don't know of a way to precisely state this mesoscopic resemblance. We sort of have, I mean, By the way, Barry has many conjectures, some related. Okay. <laughs> so he's just covering one bases. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, at the time, it was a very prescient conjecture, though, because he didn't, uh, Kostin and Leibowitz's theorem didn't come until uh, 1994 or something like that, and he made this in 1989. So, you know, he was in this, maybe he made the opposite conjecture, too, but he was a bit ahead of the game. Um, but I'd actually be very interested in having a rigorous formulation of the fact that the zeros look like eigenvalues not only microscopically, but mesoscopically. Um, it has arithmetic implications. I mean, what you should take this to mean is that any reasonable question you ask about the spacing of zeros in a mesoscopic scale has the same answer that you'd have for eigenvalues in a mesoscopic scale. And long distances are parallel, right? Of this range. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about this, yeah. Um, but. Uh, Anyways, I, so sort of in the theory of point processes, one has the convergence of distribution, and that's it. And it'd be nice to have some sort of mesoscopic version of, of convergence of distribution of point processes. In particular, it would have arithmetic implications. All right. Um, so this, this gets to the correlations at longer scales. This is sort of what Peter was talking about before. Um, I'm going to tell you why, why I restrict here to mesoscopic scales rather than larger scales. And to do this, uh, we need this formula, classical formula of Backlund, which uh, approximates this number n of t by some regular part. This, this part here is, um, well, if you use Sterling's formula, you see it's the same t over 2 pi times log t over 2 pi minus uh, t over 2 pi that we had before, plus uh, this oscillatory part, s of t, which algebraically is given by this. But the, um, this, for our purposes, isn't that important. What, what is important is that it ends up this term s of t is small, and it ends up oscillating quite a bit. And so you can think of it as being an air term in the same sense as the air term for the prime number theorem. Right? Uh, and the reason I write this uh, this way is that to talk about uh, Fuji's central limit theorem at longer scales, just because of the growth of the logarithm, we have to um, use this function s of t rather than, um, rather than the counts themselves. So we make this sort of oscillatory part of the count in an interval of, uh, of size n of t of the randomly translated and stretched out zeros. You can think about this morally as this being the count of zeros in this interval uh, minus the expected value of the count, although it's not that exactly. But at any rate, as you'd, uh, as you'd guess, the expected value of the thing is little o of 1. The variance of it is 1 over pi squared times log n of t. This is what we had before. when, when uh, n of t grows more slowly than log t. But if n of t is a longer interval, then you get 1 over pi squared times log log of t. Uh, that's if n of t is in between log t and little o of t. And again, you get a central limit theorem. So in particular, the, uh, the variance, the technical term is variance saturation. So the variance just stops growing at this larger scale, which is even more surprising. Right? It means that the, the distribution of large counts of zeros is even more rigid at a longer scale than on a, on a shorter scale. Even though, in a certain sense, individual zeros see each other a bit less at, at longer scales. So uh, this phase change, there's nothing in random matrix theory that corresponds to it. And so um, a question that I had for a long time was what causes it. For me, uh, this was resolved very strikingly with a preprint of Perez Marco. Uh, it was uploaded to the archive, although the same pattern had been found um, something like 10 years before by Valgamoni and Keating. So here I've made a histogram of gamma minus gamma prime, but I'm not stretching 
this histogram out by log t over 2 pi as we did before. Instead, I'm just leaving it as it is. Um, and we see this, this dip at the origin. That's the same thing we saw before, except now this is a width 1 over log t rather than being stretched out. Um, but it, there's also this interesting phenomenon where the histogram looks sort of random, but then it has this dip at a certain location, and then a dip at another location, and a dip at another location, and so on. And um, so I've marked in blue where the locations are. Um, there'll be a surprise later as to what those blue markings are. But we can add more zeros to this, right, and see that the, these dips stay, and they still stay. So this is a real phenomenon of the histograms. It's not just some sort of uh, artifact of the low, low data. And um, in fact, these, these blue lines, the first one is about 14.1, the next one is about 21, and the next one is about 25. Those are the, the numbers that I uh, had you memorize earlier. Those are exactly the locations of the first few uh, imaginary parts of the zeta zeros, right? So this is somehow very striking. There's something going on here where the um, gamma minus gamma prime repels away from other gamma. Um, but it doesn't do so, I mean, at the origin we have that gamma minus gamma prime repels away from zero. It does it very strongly, right? This, this trough goes all the way down to the origin. So there's this very strong repulsion. Here it's not so strong of a repulsion. In fact, um, I mean, you can see barely, this isn't uh, too long of an animation, but you can see that these troughs become less in depth as we add more zeros. So um, if I make this distance from here to here a distance of 1, then this is uh, a distance 1 over log t, the width of this trough at the origin. And on the other hand, the, if I make this distance from here to here 1, the height of the trough at the origin is, uh, is just 1, right? But on the other hand, um, the troughs around low-lying zeros, uh, their depth de uh, decreases as you make t larger, and it ends up the depth is of order 1 over log t squared. Uh, the width, on the other hand, this is harder to see, but the width doesn't change. So the width is actually really a, ma a macroscopic phenomenon. Um, now I said Bogomoni and Keating had noticed this phenomenon earlier. And in fact, they made a prediction for what this pattern should be. Um, as you can see, it's, it's fairly accurate. Uh, and the punchline of the rest of the talk is that um, one can observe this, this histogram. Um, you can see these troughs, which are macroscopic. You can see them up to a microscopically blurred resolution in the same sense you can see Montgomery's repulsion away from, from zero at a microscopically blurred resolution. Up, up to measuring against band-limited test functions, you can see this. All right, so in order to show that, um, you have to first develop a sort of vocabulary to describe how we're seeing that. And for this, I go back to Montgomery's original formulation of the pair correlation conjecture. And that is as follows. We have some test function w here. It doesn't really matter what it is. I, I guess this particular one ends up being nice because its Fourier transform has exponential decay. Um, but we have some count here of uh, gamma minus gamma prime. And uh, here I'm using e to represent e to the i2 pi zeta. And uh, so we're looking at gamma minus gamma prime, which are separated by a macroscopic distance. But we're throwing in a microscopic oscillation of the gamma minus gamma prime. I'll show you why we're doing that in a second. But his conjecture then um, is that, well, this is a theorem. He showed that this thing has the following evaluation for alpha less than 1. Uh, it's not usually commented upon, but this, this part of the conjecture. Uh, you can rewrite it just by taking the Fourier transform as integrating e of alpha x times w of 2 pi x over log t against the same measure that we had before. And here I've thrown in this delta function because we're not, we're not restricting to distinct gammas, but we let gamma equal gamma prime, and that gives the, the delta function. right? Um, and so this is, this is proven for alpha sufficiently small. And then for some any fixed m, m equal 10,000 or 10,001 or something, this is conjectured to be true uniformly for that, for that m. Uh, all right, so what does this mean? Um, well, it means, well, what can we see from this? If we integrate this function against some uh, g hat of alpha, right, integrate in alpha, then we can recover g of gamma minus, sorry, g of 2 pi over log t times gamma minus gamma prime times w of gamma minus gamma prime, the g function, uh, I mean, it's, it's bound to be 
some function with decay properties. And so we end up only seeing, I mean, that restricts our attention, having integrated like that, that restricts our attention to gamma minus gamma prime at a, a scale of one over log t, and in particular when gamma is within one over log t of gamma prime, this w function just drops out, and we do the same thing over on this side. That gives us exactly, um, exactly what, uh, what we had before for the pair correlation conjecture, right? But not only can we do that, uh, we can also integrate against uh, g hat of alpha times some uh, additive character here. And if we do that, I mean, we just integrate in here, uh, we restrict our attention to those zeros uh, where their difference is within a microscopic distance of some fixed quantity r, right? Uh, and we get an asymptotic that's uniform in R. So, I mean, we can integrate and see not only the effect of these statistics, you know, close to the origin, but also microscopically around these troughs. Uh, so the question is, why don't we see these troughs from Montgomery's prediction? And the reason is just that it's a first order asymptotic. So we have to refine the asymptotic in order to see the troughs. And um, that ends up being not terribly difficult one just requires a sort of refinement of Montgomery's analysis. It's not, um, it's not a matter of really new number theory, it's just a matter of uh, a little bit of new analysis to, to see these, these troughs, right? And of course, you can also get, um, here I'm just talking about microscopic counts around some fixed quantity R, but if you add these together, you can also get mesoscopic counts, right? And so you can recover Fuji's central limit theorem from this, this sort of process. All right. Uh, so this gives the Baldwin and Keating prediction. Uh, it's a bit complicated, um, but that's the well, what it really is. Yes, that's right. Okay, yes, I do that in the next slide. Yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of, of taking the Hadamard product and, and differentiating it. All right, so let me. I mean, the phenomenon which Bogomoli and Keating pointed out in the upper vertical one. Yeah. That is given by the small function on the line one. Yes. That makes a correction. Yeah, yeah. But you still, I mean, on the line one, you see some effect, some residual effect of the zeros, right? I'll, I'll give you a formula in the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so here's the, the formula. The main, the terms which give the troughs are these terms here, zeta prime over zeta prime of one plus iu minus some, some sort of arithmetic function here that just comes out of the analysis plus some other arithmetic term that oscillates quite a bit in t, right? Uh, and so the fact that we're restricting alpha to be sufficiently band limited, the, these terms heuristically, they, they come from uh, Hardy-Littlewood conjectures. Um, we can't really touch the Hardy-Littlewood conjectures, but the fact that there re we're restricting our oscillation to just be in this given range means that we don't really see the Hardy-Littlewood effect from these. We can replace these terms by a proxy and still prove this, this theorem. And so that's what we end up uh, doing. Um, let me, so let me talk about these terms here and explain why it is that they, uh, they're sensitive to the locations when u is equal to some low-lying gamma. All right. Uh, the reason, roughly, is just that this is the um, second derivative of the logarithm of zeta evaluated at 1 plus iu. The logarithm of zeta, of course, has some Hadamard product. You can just expand that out um, at 1 plus iu. I mean, there's no analytic difficulties in this argument. Uh, and the expression that you get is uh, this equals h of u, where h is some regular function in terms of like gamma factors, uh, minus the sum over gamma of phi of u minus gamma. Uh, where phi is some fixed function, it takes the following form. This is just, you know, just algebra. Um, and you see this, these troughs at all of the gammas. Um, I've been talking so far about low-lying zeros. It is important that they're low-lying to really see the troughs authentically. Uh, the reason for that is that these functions phi, uh, th it's the same function for each gamma, right? And so th the gammas become more dense the higher you go up. So when gamma is around, say, 10,000, there's lots of zeros in that location. And these phi's start to interfere with, with one another. Yeah, so you can't really. Yeah, you still see these phi's, but they, they start interfering with one another. And you can't really resolve matters. 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, for the zeta. I mean, I know in quantum chaos there's this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, in some sense, their analysis of these Hardy Littlewood terms is informed by the analysis in physics, which I don't, uh, it's very hard to make rigorous. I don't have a great deal of confidence that these are the the right terms, but they seem to fit numerically, and physicists seem to have a great deal of confidence that these are the, the right things to, to put here. Um, okay, yeah, so, so this was motivated, and Barry, too, was motivated by quantum chaos. Um, also, there's another phenomenology that I want to remark upon here, uh, which is these functions B of IU. Um, they just pop out of the analysis, but it's just uh, some 17th century number theory to say they have the following representation. And so, in particular, um, these are sensitive to zeta prime over zeta prime, evaluated at k of 1 plus i u. Uh, and so you see, uh, it's just barely discernible in these histograms, but you see effects at gamma over 2 also, and gamma over 3, and so on. So you can sort of see that here. The first zero is at 14.1. Um, uh, if you go to like 7.05, you see a slight uptick in this histogram, and, and so on. But these aren't, these aren't quite as noticeable as, as these lower ones, because you're only looking at this. I mean, here you're looking at zeta prime over zeta prime at 2 of 1 plus iu. Right. So how much time do I have? OK. Uh, the way one proves this uh, is, like I said, you don't really see the Hardy-Littlewood terms. Instead, you just end up substituting a proxy for it. And this is the proxy you end up substituting. It has the right oscillation. And the, um, the other terms that you get, uh, again, it's just some 17th century number theory to rewrite this, uh, this term. As, as the following thing, and these are the terms that drop out from, uh, well, really it's a sort of large sieve type technique that you end up using to get this. All right, so let me mention, before I go on to a uh, sort of whistle-stop tour of uh, the proof of this result, another result that can be proved in the same way, and this is an analog of the strong Zego theorem. Um, this is uh, a theorem which really it had its origins in asymptotics of Toeplitz determinants. Um, but it's also a theorem about these general linear statistics for, uh, for stretched out eigenvalues. And so we can do the same thing for stretched out zeta zeros, uh, count with a general test function eta, the, the counts of them that lie in a, in a given, under a given test function. Um, before, this gave us slightly more information than counting with just the arbitrary characteristic function. And it's true as well that this is slightly harder to analyze. But if your, your test function is nice enough, then the expected value of it of this general linear statistic is what you'd expect, and the variance of it has the following nice form factor, and in distribution, you get a Gaussian distribution. I want to mention, so here I'm assuming the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, Fuji's theorem did not assume the Riemann hypothesis. It just involves arbitrary ordinance of zeta zeros. It may be possible to prove this without the Riemann hypothesis, uh, and I'd, I'd be very interested in doing that. Um, yeah, so I, I forget if I mentioned, but I, I proved this and then independently. Uh, Paul Bergrad and Jeffrey Kwan also also proved the same thing. We we go in slightly different directions though. My approach is more harmonic analysis, and theirs involves instead s th this idea from random matrix theory, the helfer schostrom functional calculus. Okay, um, so the idea of how to prove this, um, I mean, really, it's the ev everything we can say about the statistics of the zeta function involves the explicit formula for the zeros of the zeta function, uh, which relates the primes to the zeros, and we end up being able to say something about the primes, so we can use that. Uh, the sort of archetypal example of this is just the Riemann explicit formula that lambda of n is given on average by 1 plus some square root of uh, square root error term that oscillates according to gamma. Um, this doesn't end up being the explicit formula that's useful for us, though. Uh, we have to use an explicit formula that's uh, either exact or extremely close to being exact. So we have to use a different explicit formula than Montgomery uses in his original approach. He uses uh, approximation due to Selberg. Um, and the other thing is that uh, you really need to use an explicit formula which takes into account the functional equation. There's two ways to get an explicit formula right. The first is just take one contour integral and then shift your contour all the way back to the uh, left. The other way, though, is to shift your contour far enough that you can see the reflection formula for the zeta function. And that's the explicit formula, which is much more helpful in this, this context. 
And to state the explicit formula, as I, I want to, um, well, actually, let me motivate why I'm going to use the explicit formula that I'll state in the next slide. So we have this, this feature of the counts. They're given by a regular approximation plus some oscillatory air term. And so in particular, we can get an atomic mass at the points gamma uh, being approximated by some regular part plus some oscillatory part, right? This regular part is just the mean density of the zeros. And we don't expect locally that this regular part um, correlates with the, uh, the locations of individual zeros, right? It does in the bulk, but it, it locally it doesn't have any correlation. And so in particular, if we know about the statistic uh, dn of xi1 plus t times dn of xi2 plus t, if we randomize t, right, this gives us the likelihood that some zero lies at xi1 and another one lies at xi2. And uh, that's just pair correlation. Uh, that's the same thing because this doesn't correlate with this as knowing ds of xi1 plus t times ds of xi2 plus t on average, right? And it works out that these statistics of ds are substantially nicer algebraically than the statistics dn. Uh, and the reason for that is the following way to write the explicit formula, which is due in varying stages to Riemann, Ganond, and Vey. Uh, it just relates the Fourier, this, this oscillatory part of the counts against the Fourier transform of some function has uh, this nice arithmetic interpretation, which gives uh, a mass at the logarithms of primes minus some regular approximation to that mass. And so having the formula in this, this format just allows us to apply, to apply Fourier analysis uh, very straightforwardly to what follows. And so this is, uh, I think this is the nicest way to write the explicit formula anyways. All right, uh, the other idea in the proof is to mimic the Montgomery Vaughan inequality, which is uh, related to the large sieve, um, by replacing these averages uh, from an interval t to 2t, uh, you, you replace this function with this a general function which has nicer properties when you take the Fourier transform of it. All right, so this uh, this certainly dates back to your paper with, with Rud to Peter's paper with Rudnick, um, but I, I don't know if I, I mean I guess in harmonic analysis it's a very old idea to replace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in some sense, this is. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is a very useful idea anyways in doing computations. All right, this next part, I don't expect you to absorb this entirely. In fact, I'm running sort of low on time. But um, the quantity we want to know about is this. Let me explain what this is. It gives mass to the zeros at xi1 and xi2 when they are macroscopically within some value s, and then we throw in these microscopic oscillations. And so if we can compute this quantity here, we're able to see the pair correlation uh, function that we had before. And it follows just from applying Fourier analysis, taking, I mean, integrating, switching the order of integration here. Um, here, you'll have to just trust me, this is a computation that works out to be. But um, the fact that we made sigma be such a nice function ends up uh, restricting x1 up to a sign to be within x2 to a scale of 1 over log t. And then we're also ensuring that x1 up to a sign is very close to alpha times log t, and also x2 up to a sign is very close to alpha log t. And then we're integrating against this combination of regular and arithmetic measures. Um, if we fix, say, x2, we're integrating x1 over such a short measure, uh, over such a short interval, rather, that um, it ends up that any of these integrals that involve, and we can expand out this, this measure here, and any of the measures that we get that involve a continuous part, you're integrating over such a short interval that these terms uh, fix x2, integrate in x1, these terms just, uh, just drop out, and we're left only with an arithmetic measure. The reason the arithmetic measure doesn't necessarily drop out is that it's an atomic mass that gives a, a weight to the logarithms of primes, right? And even in an extremely small interval, there might be some prime inside of it, and then this would have the same mass that it would have over a, a larger interval, right? So we're stuck with just this, uh, this arithmetic measure here. And uh, so this is the air term one gets, 
and the arithmetic measure you're left with is this. And because the distribution of primes is, is rigid, in particular the primes lie at integers, and the integers never clump up, here we're still restricting x1 to be very close up to assigned x2. Um, the only time that x1, when x1 is around this value, is very close to x2, that is the only time that two logarithms of primes are very close, is when they're equal. And so this double integral just ends up being a single sum, and we see this lambda squared over n term that we had here. And with a little bit of complex analysis, you can untangle this to be an integral against, uh, against these test functions that we started out with. And uh, then you need a little bit of additional work to untangle this ds of c1 plus t times ds of c2 plus t into the pair correlation measure we want, but uh, it's, it's not too bad. All right. So that is a, like I said, a very quick overview of the proof. Um, maybe I should comment. I'm told that the reason one can't do this in quantum chaos is that the, the orbits don't follow the same sort of rigidity that you have for the primes. So, so it's very important that we know something about the locations of primes. In particular, um, I mean, they occur at integers, which, which always have a distance of one between them at least. All right, uh, so I want to finally mention a more ambitious Even, even mesoscopically, right? Yeah. I mean, even, even mesoscopically, like the, the, like the analog of the Fuji central limit yeah, theorem? Yeah. It's, it's not known, right? OK. They just took diamond brackets and read the yeah. <laughs> OK, so finally, let me mention um, one application of this, this philosophy, uh, a somewhat more speculative application than what I just showed you, um, and that is to the moments of the zeta function. Um, so the quantity, which is of a long-standing interest, is, is this. And the perspective of Keating Snaith implores us to think of this as just the moments of a characteristic polynomial averaged over the unitary group. Um, the information that we rigorously have for the zeta function is macroscopic information for k-point correlation functions or k-level densities with microscopic band limitations. So we can say things about zeros that are separated by a long distance, as long as we're not counting with functions that microscopically bunch up. The analog of that and the unitary group, uh, of course, we have whatever knowledge we want to have about the unitary group. But um, suppose that we restrict our knowledge to just being able to evaluate these correlation sums when the functions eta, uh, they can occur physically anywhere on the circle. But their Fourier support uh, happens to lie in this restricted region. All right, so we have a circle. We have n eigenvalues on the circle. And we're allowing ourselves to oscillate with a frequency of 2n here. right? So at the, at the mean level spacing, this is allowing ourselves to oscillate with a frequency of 2. It's exactly the analog of what we have here. If we assume this, um, we can expand this determinant out. right? Uh, this, I mean, this is just expanding the absolute value of the square. And if k equals 1, the exponents we have are either uh, 0, 1, or negative 1. If we add them up, uh, it's less than n exponents. Um, if k equals 2, we have, uh, well, it goes from negative 2 to 2. That's still less than 2n. But suddenly, when k equals 3, you can't rigorously compute these things anymore, at least as long as you restrict your information that you have to the, this, this limitation I mentioned before. Right? So that's exactly what we know classically about the moments of the zeta function. Uh, at least rigorously, right? It has nothing to do with random matrix theory, nothing to do with count computing correlation functions, but we can rigorously deduce these asymptotics for k equals 1 and 2, but no higher. The, the way we do that is by approximate functional equations for zeta or for zeta squared. Um, so a question is whether there's a way to understand these computations, not in terms of these very special uh, splitting up of the zeta function by a function, approximate functional equation, but instead just using macroscopic k-point correlation information. And then likewise, uh, what about the conjectured asymptotics of higher moments? Um, so Keating and Snaith have, the, have a prediction for this. Bogomoni and Keating have predictions for not just the pair correlation function with more oscillation, but for other correlation functions as well. Can you take those formulas? I mean, you have to find a way to rigorously state them. 
But having done that, can you recover this information, the, the Keating-Snaith conjecture for the moments of zeta? And I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's a very interesting question to pursue. So uh, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. So what one ends up with? Um, is uh have s of t, this function s of t, uh, better remember the formula now, but it, it should be approximated by p less than or equal to t to the 1 over k times the sine of t times log p over p to the uh, 1 half plus i t, where t is in the interval uh, negative t to t. And this resemblance here is in the LK norm. I think I got this right. Maybe I should put 2k here. But, but it's something like this, right? Um, this ends up being, so, so this is the way Fuji proves his central limit theorem as well from this. When you're working with uh, like the theorem that I proved and Bugat and Kwan proved, it doesn't quite work to approximate things this way. I mean, this only gives you information. I mean, if you want to compute n of t plus h minus n of t, right, this, um, well, minus its expected value, uh, this thing is very close to s of t plus h minus s of t. And this is how Fuji computes things. Uh, this really only gives you information about general test functions that are sums of characteristic functions. But uh, the, I guess, message is that the way to prove this formula is just by using the explicit formula uh, in a kind of clever way. And if you spend a bit more time using the explicit formula, you can make these test functions into something more, more general. Yeah, when, but when it's, you know it's Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Yes. Um, not very much. I mean, so there's uh, kind of the simplest example, other than the zeta function is just the family of primitive quadratic characters. In that case, I think it's, it's not too hard to extend this argument. It's just sort of extending Rubenstein's argument. But uh, other than that, uh, I haven't, I, it may be much more difficult for like higher degree so functions. Is yeah. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, I, mean one way of it, I mean, it's heuristic though, they've done, but. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, yeah, yeah. So there's also, I mean, there's the next order, and then there's also like macroscopic information. And to see the macroscopic distance is a bit harder. But. <laughs>